Good morning. If you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, we are continuing our series on raising 4D kids. If you're visiting with us, we're so happy that you have come. And yeah, you're jumping in a little late on the series, but that's totally fine uh, because they can kind of stand alone each lesson. Uh, hang on, my, my screen is doing some weird things up here. Give me one second. <clears throat> All right, that monitor is not working this morning. That's fine. I'll look at the one in the back. Um, Luke 2:52 gives us a glimpse into Jesus' early life. This is when he was 12 years old, and it tells us about how he grew up. And it says in verse 52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to do my best here. This monitor is like flickering and annoying me, so I'm going to turn it that way <laughs> so I don't have to look at it. Always some distraction going on uh, to test me and my ability to concentrate. <laughs> so uh, in this three-part series, um, in the first lesson and really the second lesson, all these lessons, we start with this point that... Olympic athletes, they make their sport look really easy, and it just looks so natural to them because it is like second nature. And we talked about how the only reason that is possible for what we see on TV when we watch their performance to look so easy is because of all of the years of preparation that we don't see that went into that. And likewise, during Jesus' three-year ministry, he makes everything look so easy too. And that's not just because he was God in the flesh and so oh, everything was easy for Jesus because he was God in the flesh. No, it's because of all of the years of preparation uh, that went into his growth as a person. And we get a glimpse of that in Luke 2, 52. And parents, how awesome would it be for your kids to grow up to the point where Christianity just looks easy for them? Not that it actually is easy, but that it looks easy because it's just second nature to them. Well, that can only happen if you take advantage of these precious years of preparation that you have with your children to sort of, using the iceberg image, expand the foundation of their iceberg so that when they finally get ready to leave the house, they'll be able to change the world for Jesus and make it look easy. Now, the great thing about Luke 2.52 is it shows us four dimensions of preparation. You have mental, physical, spiritual, and social so that your child will grow up to be a well-rounded individual made in the image of God. And as we've said before, we need all four of these dimensions. If we are missing one, we will be like the three-wheeled reliant from the 70s that ironically wasn't very reliant at all. If we don't grow mentally, we won't have much direction or wisdom to navigate the world because we won't understand how life works. If we don't have physical growth, we won't have much time in the world because we're not going to be healthy. And the time that we do have, uh, it's not going to be very high quality. If we don't grow spiritually, there's not much point to living in this world because Jesus Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but then loses his soul? And lastly, if you don't have social growth, you won't have any influence in the world because you won't get along with others. Now, last time we talked about spiritual growth, and for our final lesson this morning, we're going to talk about this last element of social growth. The way Luke describes it is being in favor with men. You know, it's amazing how many articles have come out over the past few years about how employers really do not want to hire Gen Zers. Because Gen Zers, they say, have terrible communication skills. They have a lack of professionalism, a disregard for proper workplace attire. They don't look you in the eye or project their voices, and they don't handle conflict well. And so the companies that do end up hiring Gen Zers, many of them are saying, we're actually hosting etiquette classes for them. Now, this sermon series isn't about getting a good job, okay? Though, that will be a side benefit of having 4D growth. As a well-rounded individual in the image of God, you probably will uh, do well in your career, but, but that's not the main goal. The main goal is to glorify God. And if we have all of this Bible knowledge, but we have no social etiquette, well, then we're not going to have any influence for Christ in the world because people won't want to be around us. 
There's a psychologist named Jordan Peterson. He wrote a fantastic book called 12 Rules for Life. And there's one chapter in particular I think is worth the price of the whole book. Uh, the, this is the, the title of that chapter. Don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. His argument is that parents need to be willing to discipline their kids so they don't turn out to be annoying people. And he writes this. He says, parents are the arbiters of society. They teach children how to behave so that other people will be able to interact meaningfully and productively with them. If a child has not been taught to behave properly by the age of four, it will forever be difficult for him or her to make friends. Children her own age will be put off by her inability to cooperate. They'll fight with her or wander off and find someone else to play with. The parents of those children will observe her awkwardness and misbehavior and won't invite her back to play with their kids. She will be lonely and rejected, and that will produce anxiety, depression, and resentment. The research literature is quite clear on this. This matters because peers are the primary source of socialization after the age of four. Rejected children cease to develop because they are alienated from their peers. This is not good. Much more of our sanity than we commonly realize is a consequence of our fortunate immersion in a social community. In Genesis 2, in verse 18, God says, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God designed humans for relationship, first in a family unit and then as a part of larger society. And though I realize Peterson is taking a, you know, more of a secular approach to the subject, his observations are so practical and, and they show us how our social skills can actually affect not just how we perceive ourselves, but also our impact in the world as we're relating to those around us. And that social training starts at home by instilling the following four skills in your children. Number one, respect for authority. Look in Luke chapter 2. Um, you know, after Jesus' parents come back to get him, when he stayed behind in Jerusalem, listen to how Jesus treats them in verse 51. Luke 2, 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Notice he continued in subjection to them. How amazing that the Son of God, who has all authority to rule the entire universe, is willing to submit himself to the authority of his parents. Ephesians 6. Looks like the screen's working again. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. You know, of all of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother is the only one that has a promise attached to it. And the promise is things will go well for you and you will live a long life. And I think that's because if we don't learn to respect those in authority at home, our, our parents, that's going to cause all kinds of problems for us in society. If we don't respect the authority of our parents, we're not going to respect the authority of our teachers, and we're not going to respect the authority of our principals, and we're not going to respect the authority of the shepherds in the church. We won't respect our elders in general out in society. So when an older person speaks to us and tries to teach us wisdom, we will ignore them. We won't, we won't respect God's authority. The, the ultimate authority. We won't have respect for that either. And then in extreme cases in this life, we may not even respect the police's authority and we may end up in jail for it. Uh, there was a recent news story about a sheriff in Florida who is fed up with kids calling in fake mass shooting threats to schools. So apparently this is happening a lot and it's draining law enforcement's resources and it's just, you know, hindering and disrupting schools. And this particular sheriff, he's not just fed up with kids doing this. He's fed up with the parents who have raised kids who think that it is okay or who think that it is funny to do things like this. And he put out this statement, quote, since parents, you won't raise your kids, I'm going to start raising them. 
Every time we make an arrest for one of these phony calls, your kid's photo is going to be put up online. And if I can do it, I'm going to perp walk your kid so everyone can see what your kid has been up to. Now, you can agree or disagree with that approach. Okay? Maybe you say that sounds a little harsh, okay? But the point is clear. Eventually, every one of us is going to learn respect for authority. And it's either going to be the easy way at home with our parents or the hard way with this guy, okay, with Sheriff Chitwood, okay? You don't want to fall into his hands. In Peterson's book, he says the problem is parents are too afraid to discipline their kids because they don't want to be the bad guy, and they're afraid to cause their child pain. But listen to what I love how he says this. He says, but they do not at all rescue or protect their children from fear and pain. Quite the contrary. The judgmental and uncaring broader social world will mete out conflict and punishment far greater than that which would have been delivered by a good parent. You can discipline your children or you can turn that responsibility over to the harsh, uncaring, judgmental world. And the motivation for the latter decision should never be confused with love. Look in Luke 2, Luke 2, verses 46 and 47. It says, after three days, they found Jesus in the temple. This is, again, he's 12 years old here. Sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Even at 12 years old, Jesus not only respected his parents, he respected the other adults in his life. And because of that, the adults actually wanted to be around him. Jesus was not just some punk kid to them. No, his respect increased his influence with them. So parents, here's some practical tips for fostering respect for authority. Teach your children to say sir and ma'am when you give them instructions. This is a helpful way to teach them the difference between you and their friends. You are their friend, yes, but you are much more than their friend. Secondly, help them refer to other adults as Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so. Don't let them call adults by their first name. This also builds respect for adults because it's not just, oh, you're an adult, you're my pal, you're, you're like one of my peers. No, it's Mr. I'm acknowledging you are above me in some way. Thirdly, Help them pay attention when an adult speaks to them. I understand this takes time to develop, and obviously a two-year-old is going to have a hard time even acknowledging you know, an, an adult. But even when they're four or five, they may be shy when an adult speaks to them, but that's a great opportunity to try to give them courage and, and to speak up and to recognize, hey, you're being spoken to, and you want to respect that adult by speaking to them in return or acknowledging them in conversation. And then finally, help them obey the first time that they are asked. Again, this is going to take some time. Help them obey the first time without protest or back talk. You want to get your kids to the point where it's yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, and not, huh? How come I got to do that? That's not fair. You didn't tell my sister to do that. But no, first time obedience. Secondly, good manners. I realize there aren't any really Bible verses about specific manners, because a lot of manners sort of vary from, from culture to culture. So there's not a Bible verse about, you know, not smacking our lips when we're chewing food. Okay? But, but there are many verses about living in a respectful, dignified manner. So for instance, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 and 20, Paul says, though I am free from all men, I've made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as those under the law, though not myself being under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. So manners vary from culture to culture. And what Paul's saying is whatever culture he's in, he tries to respect the cultural norms so that he does not annoy people or offend people. Because if he does that, he knows he's going to lose influence for Jesus. In Titus, Paul gives this instruction, In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine dignified. To live in a dignified way is to comport oneself in an honorable manner. 
the chapter about love in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not act unbecomingly. Some translations say love does not, does not act rudely. And I think this is interesting to think about, that good manners are an act of love for our neighbor. You know, I remember as a kid thinking how arbitrary and ridiculous it was that my dad, he just kept trying to get me to stop picking my notes. And I thought, why is he telling me that? What, what kind of rule is that? But it wasn't arbitrary at all, okay? Because picking your nose is gross. And it's an act of love to your neighbor to stop picking your nose because picking your nose grosses people out. And it's not loving to gross people out. To our young kids, okay, try, try to just envision the scene. I mean, you, you've got parents down the street and they have kids. And, and those parents, they want their kids to make friends, and so they invite you over because they want their kids to be friends with you. And they invite you over for a Saturday, spend the afternoon with them, maybe have dinner with the family. But the entire day, you're picking your nose. And then, and then when it's time to eat, you're just smacking your lips while you're chewing and you're talking with your mouth full and you're talking over people, interrupting people in conversation. You're clanging your silverware around. And instead of using a napkin, you're just using the back of your hand like a napkin. And, you know, you're the guest in the house. And so the family, they let, they let you serve yourself first. Okay? But, but you already start eating and you're halfway done with your meal before the family has even got seated. Now, the question is, do you think that that family is going to be eager to have you back over? <laughs> you think you're going you're to get an invite? No. And, and, and who could blame them? Because you, you in that case were acting rudely and not in a dignified way. You were disrespecting social, cultural norms. Let's consider some other good manners, like taking care of your personal hygiene. If we are not showering daily, people aren't going to want to be around us because we stink. If we don't brush our teeth, how are we going to have a conversation with someone about Jesus when our breath is knocking them over? <laughs> Greet people with a firm handshake, good eye contact, and a projected voice. Now, girls can get away with you know, not having the, the handshake, at least until later in life. But for boys especially, work on a firm handshake. A lot of Gen Zers get complaints in the work world because their handshakes feel like a dead fish. And they're just staring at the ground, and they're not looking at you, and it's just really super weird and awkward. And project your voice so that when you introduce yourself and you're talking to people, people don't have to lean in and go, huh, huh, what, what, what did you say your name was again? Can I... Look, if we are too timid to speak up and say our own name in a way that it can be heard, how are we going to be courageous enough to speak Jesus' name so people can hear his name in conversation? Say please, thank you, and excuse me. The word please recognizes this person doesn't owe me anything, but I'm asking, I'm making a request because I, I value your help and I need your help. Thank you is an expression of appreciation for that person. And it's saying, what you did for me, I consider a gift and a blessing. Excuse me respects people's boundaries. So, you know, if somebody's in your way, you don't just say, you know, get out of my way. You say, excuse me. And if you have to interrupt somebody in conversation, you say, excuse me, because you're showing, I'm not interrupting you because I, I just don't care what you have to say. It's just, I, I need to interrupt you, so, so here's an excuse me for that. You're respecting people's boundaries. Learn to share. Sharing what you have with others, that's an act of love and cooperation. It invites others into your life, and it says, I'm your friend, and what is mine is yours. But when a kid hogs all the toys and they won't play well with others, they're saying, life is all about me. And unfortunately, you is all you will have because no one will want to be around you if you have that approach and not sharing. Think about this. Good manners are really an expression of the golden rule, as we call it. Matthew 7, 12, in, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. You know, if, if I would want others to share with me, and that would make me feel included, feel like a friend if someone shared with me, well, then that's what, what I want to do with them. I, I want to also share with them. If I would want others to not tap their finger incessantly on the dinner table or walk around just humming and whistling all the time or hog the bathroom for an hour and only give me two minutes to use it, well, then I'm not going to do that to them either. 
Those are not good manners. Thirdly, good communication skills. First of all, listen well. Luke 2, 46, we, we just read that, where it says Jesus was both listening to them and asking them questions. Again, it's so amazing to see Jesus. I mean, he's the creator of the universe. He's the one who has all the answers to life, and yet he's asking them questions, and he's listening to them. It has been said that God gave us two ears and one mouth because he wants us to listen twice as much as we speak. James 1 and verse 19 says, This you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You know, my brother, he went through a phase when he was a teenager that just drove me crazy. I would ask him a question, like, how's school going? And sometimes with teenagers, the problem is they won't give you any answer. My brother, he would give me a, a very detailed answer, kind of a long answer. And I was appreciative of that because I wanted to know. I really wanted to know how things were going. But, but my brother's issue is he would never then turn it around and ask me a question in return. So I'd ask him five questions and, you know, he'd just go down the line and give me long answers for all five questions. But never once did he put the ball back in my court and ask me how I was doing or any sort of life updates. And so it didn't feel connective at all. I, I didn't feel like there was any relationship there. Why? Because it wasn't a conversation. It was an interview. I felt like he was a celebrity, you know, and I'm a journalist, and I've got a list of questions, and I want to go and interview my brother. You know, what did you think about that? And, oh, great. And he answers that. And then, but he does all the talking, and he doesn't have to do any listening. And I, I finally had to confront him about it, and I, and I told him about this. Look, th these are just interviews. These are not conversations anymore. And that really stuck with him. He, he told me later, he, he was appreciative that I talked to him about that, because he did. He changed his total approach, and, and next time I talked to him, like he was asking me questions and getting better about that. And he told me like that helped all of his relationships and it even helped him succeed in, in his career as well. Why? Because people want to be heard. People want to be understood. And if we have no interest in understanding and all we do, all we want to do is talk about ourselves, no one is going to be, want to be around us and we're not going to have influence on them for the gospel. You know, if anyone could have set up interviews, it would have been Jesus there in the temple, you know. Yeah, you heard right. I'm the Messiah. Any questions for me? <laughs> he didn't do that. Instead, it says he asked them questions. That is just remarkable to me. Proverbs 18, verse 2 says, A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. I'll give you another illustration. One time I went over to a family's house for dinner, and I kid you not, literally everyone was talking at the same time. <laughs> there were four kids, and so you had two siblings. They were in their own little conversation over here, and then you had another two siblings, and they were in their own conversation over here, and I was trying to talk to the parents, but I couldn't even hear myself think because the, com the competition there in, in conversation, what happened is nobody could hear themselves think, so what did they do? They started talking louder. So these siblings start louder because so they could, you know, hear themselves over their other siblings, and well, now they got to raise their volume, and now the entire table. It's just absolute pandemonium. But that was normal in their household. That's just what they did. And it, was, it was really not a pleasant experience for me at all. And the problem with setting up your household like that and allowing that to happen is no one is being trained to listen. And you know, a great way to develop listening is to teach your kids not to interrupt people when they are talking but to wait their turn and to listen to the conversation while they're waiting. You, some kids, too, like they, they'll learn the whole, okay, i got to wait my turn thing. But then as soon as it's their turn, they just totally change the subject. And it's as if they weren't listening at all to what the conversation was going on at the table. And so you can tell them in that moment, look, we're not finished with this conversation. Let's finish this conversation first, and then we'll get to your topic. Do you have anything to add to this conversation? And treat them to listen to what's going on around them and jump into that in a, in a way that's participative and not disruptive. Secondly, encourage them to use words to build others up. In Ephesians 4, 29, Paul says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those 
who hear. Encourage your kids to use words like bricks to build beautiful buildings. That's what the word edification means. It means to build up. So use your words like bricks to construct and build these beautiful buildings. Don't use your words like wrecking balls that are destroying and tearing buildings down. Some parents let their kids get in the habit of complaining and mocking and insulting and using sarcasm. In extreme cases, some, some parents think it's funny when their kids use curse words. But again, who's going to want to be around a kid like that? And, and are the parents down the street going to want your kid hanging out with their kids if they know your kid's tongue is poison? Proverbs 16, 13 says, Righteous lips are the delight of kings. And he who speaks right is loved. You know, when you use your words well, people will love you. And they will want to be around you. And even kings and CEOs will want to be in your presence. Now, I understand the goal in life is not for everyone to love us. It's not for everyone to like us. That's not my point. Obviously, we have to take stands for the truth that some people aren't going to like. And some people aren't going to want to be around us because of the, the stands that we take for truth. I get all that. But social growth matters because the point is we need to be likable, well-adjusted people. Even Jesus grew in favor with men, not because he was a people pleaser and he was just willing to sacrifice truth in order to fit in. No, it's because he understood the better he was at forming relationships, the better chance he had to reach people with the truth. And here's a helpful acronym. You guys may have heard this before, but it's worth repeating. I think it's helpful. And every one of these is rooted in scripture. And it's the idea of think before you speak. And this is what the acronym stands for. The first one is, is what I'm about to say true? Because if I'm a liar, not only am I displeasing to God, but people won't be able to trust me and won't want to be friends with me. Secondly, is what I'm about to say helpful? Is it going to help someone or is it going to hurt them? Is it going to build them up or is it going to knock them down? Thirdly, is it innocent? Is what I'm about to say pure? Or is it unwholesome? Like Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, warns us against unwholesome, impure words. Fourthly, is it necessary? Do I... Do I really need to say this? It's interesting, Ephesians 4.29, Paul says, whatever you say, make sure it meets the need of the moment. And sometimes we say things just to hear ourselves talk or because we want the last word. Or maybe our comment, you know, we could say it, but if, if we say it, it might sort of in a roundabout way end up throwing someone else under the bus. Or, or, or maybe, maybe what we have to say, it, it needs to be said, but not right now. It, it may not be the proper time or place for it. And so we may just need to wait until later until we say it. And then fifth, is it kind? Is what I'm about to say considerate of other people's feelings and their circumstances in life? And I think this also has to do with our tone. Do, is my tone kind as well? Is there love and compassion in my voice? Or am I just shouting in scorn? Is there forgiveness in my words or only condemnation? Again, Ephesians 4.29 20, says to use our words as acts of grace. And then thirdly on this point, help them gain the courage to be social. Some kids love to talk, and you don't have that problem, okay? But, but others are, are more shy, and they, they, don't, they don't really like talking, and maybe they're afraid of social situations. Maybe they're afraid they'll say the wrong thing, or they won't fit in, or they don't like the sound of their voice, or they don't think their opinions matter, or maybe they just don't like the attention. And while certainly, parents, you, you want to treat your kids as individuals, right? The point is not, okay, maybe your kid is a little more introverted. You don't have to turn them into an extroverted social butterfly. That, that's not the point. But what you do want to do is put them in situations where they are sort of forced to interact socially, even if it's kind of scary for them. See, unfortunately, some parents, they see that their kids are reluctant to engage in social events or situations, and so they just let them not engage, and they let them retreat to their phone or to their computer or to video games or whatever because that, that's safer for them. But they need to be pushed outside of their comfort zones and learn to own their voice. Uh, Proverbs 18.1 says, he who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. I remember as a kid, I was scared of social um, 
interactions, and it was just so much easier to isolate myself. I was an only child, and I had video games, and I had TV that I could easily retreat to. And it was, it was, it was an escape that was so much easier, but it, but it was really, according to this verse, and of course, just realizing it, looking back, like that, that was just selfish. I, I was just seeking my own desires, and I was not appreciating the value of connecting and building relationships with people. And what was happening was I was building antisocial tendencies in myself that ended up hurting my relationships with other people. And so I just determined when I went off to college that I was quitting video games cold turkey. And that, that, was, that was super hard, <laughs> I'm telling you. I, I really think I sort of went through withdrawals. I was just, I really wanted to play video games and I'm just sitting there on my bed. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to play. Not because, just because of the video games, but because of the online friends that I made. I was sort of cutting those relationships off too because I realized I have to learn to interact with flesh and blood people in the real world. And, and if I'm going to make the most of my college experience and, and my growth as a human being, I have to actually talk to real human beings and force myself into these different social situations. And I'll tell you, because I waited until college, that was extremely hard as a transition to, to make that transition. That, that was very difficult. I wish it would have started earlier, but it was critical to my growth. And then, you know, I became a preacher. Like, who? nobody, if you told me, you know, you're a kid, you're going to be a preacher and you're going to have social interactions with the whole church and all that, I'd say, you're crazy. What are you talking about? I just like to play video games. But because I forced myself to, to step outside that comfort zone, that is what led to growth. And that is, so, that is so crucial. So don't wait until college to do that. Parents, start that earlier. Here's some practical ways to do that. Sign them up for social events. If they're homeschooled, join a co-op. Limit their screen time. Encourage participation at the dinner table. Again, they don't have to be ex extroverts and just talking the whole time at dinner. But but you don't want them to just be silent at dinner, especially for every dinner. Maybe they're going through a hard time and they need to be silent sometimes. But, but you want to encourage them, ask them questions, get them talking, get them asking their family members questions as well at the dinner table. When the time is right, and it's so hard for me to say this because I just remember the absolute terror when this happened the first time. It was Wendy's. I remember it was Wendy's. And my... Usually my dad would order for me, and then all of a sudden, I don't even remember how old I was, nine or something, like, and he just turned to me, he's like, you can order your own sandwich, son. And I was like, no, I cannot. <laughs> and I'm just staring up at this towering figure, you know, at the cashier, just staring down at me. What do you want? And it was just frightening, right? And I don't think I, I think I stuttered, and I just, you know, I, I had to say it multiple times. It didn't come out loud enough, and I just said the wrong order probably, <laughs> but, uh, but that, was, that was so important because I, I had to learn to speak up and I had to learn that my, my voice matters, okay? Encourage them to respond, again, to adults when they're spoken to, even when they're shy, okay? And again, they don't have to go on, you know, have this huge long dialogue with an adult, okay? But, but just acknowledge an adult has spoken to you, answer them, maybe ask them a question back. Really, really healthy to do that. This all teaches them that they have a voice, their voice matters, and it should be used to connect with others because God designed us for relationships. And finally this morning, good emotional intelligence. Proverbs 16, 32 says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who captures a city. One of the greatest skills you can teach your children is that they need to rule their emotions instead of allowing their emotions to rule them. When we're kids, we, we think that our emotions just justify our behavior. So, you know, I'm angry, and so, hey, I can just throw a temper tantrum right here in the middle of the store, and I can hit my sister in the head with a toy truck because me angry. If I'm sad, well, hey, I'm sad. So that means when I'm sad, I can ignore people when they talk to me because I'm not in the mood to talk to you and it's my party and I can cry if I want to. Okay, the Bible is great at, at acknowledging, yes, you can feel what you're feeling, but we still have to control our actions. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 4, be angry and yet do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. I love how the Bible gives us permission to feel what we're feeling, but then holds us accountable for what we do with that feeling. And we can use this verse to give us 
a three-step process for working through our emotions. First of all, name it. What exactly am I feeling? What, what does it feel like to, to feel this thing? How does it feel in, in my body? And parents, there are all kinds of feelings charts that you can find online which are really helpful in teaching your kids about all the different emotions that they might be feeling. And they can even point to the chart and say, this is the one, you know, this is the one that I'm feeling right now. So, you know, let, let's say your child just shouts at you and says, this is so unfair. And they storm off and they just slam the door. Now, your initial response as a parent is probably going to be to say, hey, you don't talk to us like that and we don't slam doors in this house. That's fine. That's good to, to set that boundary with them. But you want to go deeper with them and try to, try to explore what just happened there in that moment. Try to explore what emotion they are, they are feeling and what's going on with them. So you might, you might think, well, I already know they're feeling. They're just, they just don't like the rules. You know, they're just disrespectful. But, but maybe, maybe when, they, when they find out what it is, you're going to get some deeper insight into it. And I'm jumping ahead. That's why I was pausing. I, I knew I wasn't supposed to be there. Let's get back to the naming it part. Ask them to describe it. Use one of these charts to describe what's going on in them. And, you know, it should be that emotion is probably going to be pretty easy to identify anger. Then ask them to describe it. How does that anger feel? And maybe they say, well, my cheeks are really hot, right? And my, and my chest is really tight. Okay? Now, once, once you name it, you understand, okay, this is what I'm feeling. Now we can tame it. And this is where kids can keep their feelings from controlling their actions. And a great way to tame our emotions and keep us from sinning is to ask, where is this feeling coming from? And parents, you can guide your kids to this and say, hey, what was it that that made you so angry. And, and again, <laughs> this is where I jumped ahead earlier. Your, your initial response is, well, I, I already know what they're feeling. I already know where this came from. They're just being rebellious and they don't like our rules. But maybe, maybe they tell you this. Maybe they say, you know, it just feels like you and daddy are always singling me out and nothing I do is ever good enough for you. Now you're getting a little bit of a glimpse that behind the anger is actually sadness. And if what your child said to you just now is a true statement, that's a great opportunity to apologize to them and to seek their forgiveness because that, that, that was not your, your intention and that could be a great healing moment. But here's the thing, even if what your child says was not true, that still is what your child is feeling. And you can still acknowledge and say, wow, that must be really hard. You know, we, we never intended for you to feel that way. And maybe you could sort of explain to them what was really going on. And, and sometimes our feelings don't always match reality. And you can sort of help them with that. But you can validate whatever they're going through. And another good thing is to get them thinking about what sins their anger tempted them to commit. And in their case, what sins that actually did cause them to commit by disrespecting and mouthing off their parents and, and slamming the door. And you can tell them, you, you understand why they felt so angry, but that still doesn't give them the right to blow up. And next time they're angry, a great, another great way to tame it is to go to God in prayer, ask Him to help you with that emotion, and, and take some deep breaths, and then maybe go take some quiet time alone until you calm down. And then thirdly, Aim it. God gave us feelings as signals to help us know how things are going in our relationship with Him, in our relationship with others, and even what's going on inside of us. And if something isn't going well, Paul says to do something about it. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, which means take some steps to resolve that anger. So God wants us to use our feelings to give us some aim and direction on what next step to take to heal our relationship with him and with others. If it's jealousy, well, I need to aim it toward repenting of my own bitter heart. If it's sadness, I need to aim it toward grieving or toward expressing my hurt to someone who really let me down. If it's anger, after I've tamed that anger so that it's not in control of me and it's not going to cause me to blow up on somebody, I may need to aim that toward confronting a person who sinned against me. You know, emotional intelligence, that's really going to help you with conflict resolution as well. 
because you're going to understand what, what's going on and, and what caused the situation. You know, after the lesson last week, one of our moms came to me and she said, you know, I have to confess, a lot of times I, I tell my kids to stop doing things because it's annoying and, and not because it's dishonoring God. And we talked about how, yeah, that, that is the number one motivation for changing your behavior is because, hey, you, you want to honor God. And I appreciate her heart for coming to me. But, you know, it is, it is also a legitimate thing to teach your kids not to be annoying. Now, you want to be careful not to insult them and not just say you're annoying. Don't say that, but say that when you do that behavior, that's, an, that's a behavior that annoys other people. And that's so important because if they grow up to be an annoying teenager and then an annoying adult, again, nobody's going to want to be around them. They're not going to be able to reach anybody with the gospel. And I just want to finish with a summary uh, from Peterson's book about basic social skills for kids, which are all true, uh, but I appreciate <laughs> it. It's a little humorous just because he, he's approaching this strictly from a, a strictly pragmatic perspective. And... He's very matter-of-fact about it. Okay, so here's a great summary of everything we talked about. He says, Do not bite, kick, or hit unless it's in self-defense. Do not torture and bully other children so you don't end up in jail. Eat in a civilized and thankful manner so that people are happy to have you at their house and pleased to feed you. Learn to share so other kids will play with you. Pay attention when spoken to by adults so they don't hate you and might therefore deign to teach you something. Go to sleep properly and peaceably so that your parents can have a private life and not resent your existence. <laughs> take, take care of your belongings because you need to learn how and because you're lucky to have them. Be good company when something fun is happening so that you're invited for the fun. Act so that other people are happy you're around, so that people will want you around. A child who pays attention instead of drifting and can play and does not whine and is comical but not annoying and is trustworthy, that child will have friends wherever he goes. His teachers will like him and so will his parents. If he attends politely to adults, he will be attended to, smiled at, and happily instructed. He will thrive in what can so easily be a cold, unforgiving, and hostile world. And again, I understand He's just approaching this from a strictly pragmatic perspective. But everything he says here is based on biblical principles. And if we can grow up with these crucial social skills, we will grow up like Jesus did, having favor not just with God, but with our fellow man. And it will help us then to reach them with the gospel. So parents, now is the time. These are the precious years of preparation. And if you will raise 4D kids, they'll be ready when the time comes to go out and change the world for Christ. And hopefully, like those Olympic athletes, they'll make it look easy because it'll just be second nature to them. If you're here and you're not a Christian, it's important to understand raising 4D kids starts with you in your own 4D growth. And if you're not growing spiritually, and if you don't have favor with God first, then nothing else we talked about even matters. You've got to have that favor with God because, again, if you have the whole world, but you've lost your soul, everything is pointless. But you can gain your soul this morning. If you'll come to Jesus, you can be forgiven of all of your sins. You can be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins and come up a new person ready now to be on this path of 4D growth and then to set an example for your kids so that they will be looking to you as the example of 4D growth that will then motivate them to follow your example. And if you are a Christian already, but you've not been growing spiritually at all and you've not even cared to grow in a 4D way, you can repent of that. You can change your mind, come back to God. He will help you and lift you up. We will help you and lift you up. Let us know if we can help you spiritually in any way this morning. Come forward and let us know while we stand and sing.